We got a worldwide flood of questions about thermodynamics and information. I hope you brought your intelligently designed brain along, as well as a whole bunch of coffee, because you're going to need it for this special edition of Genesis Week. And a welcome to this episode of Genesis Week, the weekly program of creationary commentary on news, views, and events pertaining to the Origins controversy. Proudly brought to you by the supporters of CORE Ottawa, Citizens for Origins Research and Education, and now carried on the Chris Cinema Network, Christian Cinema at its finest. The Bible did not say, love the Lord your God with all your mindlessness, but rather we believe God gave you a brain for a reason. <laughs> and boy, you're going to need it this week. Excellence in pirate broadcasting we set up in the lower base station in Toronto, where we continue to broadcast the information the anti-creationists don't want you to see or hear, and giving glory to our creator while doing it. Remember, if you get lost in cyberspace, just punch in wazulu.com, that's me, or genesisweek.com, and you will find us. And you can also subscribe to our YouTube channel to keep up to date and get extras like Crevo rants and special interviews with our guests. I'm your host, Ian Judy. I was inundated by requests and questions the past week or so about thermodynamics and information. Requests from YouTube, several lengthy debates on Facebook, email, and the likes. Now, the two subjects are intimately intertwined, and in fact, my video on thermodynamics has been long overdue. So, we're devoting this show to making a formal exposition on the matter. Now, I'm going to try to make a really, really complicated subject easy to understand for the layman. But you're going to have to take your fish oil tablets and drink your coffee or favorite energy drink for this one. Thermodynamics is a powerful tool that can be used in the origins debate. The laws of thermodynamics are well established and affect every aspect of the sciences, though the connection may not be obvious at first. Now, what is thermodynamics? Well, like aerodynamics is the study of the flow of air, thermodynamics is the study of the flow of heat. Heat always flows from a hotter zone to a colder zone, and we're going to focus on the first two laws of thermodynamics. The first law of thermodynamics states that energy is neither created nor destroyed, it merely changes form. The second law is the one that has the most significance to the origins debate, and states that energy in the universe that is available to do work is continually decreasing. All energy eventually becomes waste background heat, evenly distributed throughout the universe. Now, if heat only flows from hotter to colder areas, but energy, but everything is the same temperature, then there is no heat flow and no energy available for work. It is a dead universe. So everything in our universe is continually running downhill towards this universal heat death. So what on earth does this have to do with the origins debate? Well, let's start off with the basics. Now, I got into a pile of trouble with Crevo rant number 94, Frogs Are Useful Part 2. Oh boy. In that rant, I simulated, simulated, putting a frog in a blender to make a point. Now, I didn't actually bend a f blend a frog. I wouldn't do that. But apparently my special effects were more effective than I realized and really upset a lot of people. Sorry. But the frog in a blender makes an easy to understand example of the second law of thermodynamics. Our frog soup will now decay. And as it does so, it will give off heat. This effect of decay producing heat is especially visible with a rotting pile of sawdust or hay. The heat produced can be immense. So where is this heat coming from? Well, energy from the sun was used to make this wood or hay when it was alive. When the plant dies, it starts to decay. And all that energy that was used to build the plant was effectively stored in the plant and is now released as waste background heat. Now, this is another scientific and natural law that evolution must violate, and it must violate it in two ways. The first and most obvious being the production of the first life from non-life. Now, we just saw what happens even if we have complex cells which are dead. They don't come back to life, they decay. So, in order to produce the first life from raw chemicals, evolution must act in opposition to this well-established and observed process. But as you will see, the second law also applies to the production of new species. If evolution must violate scientific and natural laws, 
then by definition, evolution is neither scientific nor natural. It is a supernatural process. The releasing of the energy back into the universe as waste background heat is called entropy. Now, I'm sorry, this will be confusing at first. Technically, more entropy means less energy available for work, but it's generally described as more disorder. For example, the cells in our frog are incredibly complex, but as they break down, they break down into disorder. This is an increase in entropy. More entropy is more disorder. If the frog is living and it makes a new cell, this is a decrease in entropy, a decrease in disorder, an increase in order and arrangement. So we see entropy occurring around us all the time, complex items breaking down into disorder and disarray and releasing the energy that made them back into the universe as waste background heat. Now you yourself have seen the laws of thermodynamics in action all around you. Now, the anti-creationists will do a song and dance about open systems, closed systems, isolated systems, and energy from the sun. An isolated system is a thermodynamic system in which everything is encased within a boundary and there is no exchange of heat, work, or matter between the system and the outside world. For example, we might have a solid floating box in outer space that is super insulated. The box is the boundary. Nothing can get in and nothing can get out. Its walls are solid, so no work can be done through the box, and it's super insulated, so no heat gets in and no heat gets out. Sometimes people will mix up isolated systems with closed systems. A closed system is a thermodynamic system where material cannot enter or leave the system, but heat and work can. For example, the cooling system on your refrigerator would be considered a closed system. It gets energy from the wall socket, exchanges heat with the room, but the system is effectively sealed. Then there's open systems. An open system is where heat, work, and matter can both enter and leave the system. An open box would be an example. Now, some anti-creationists have said that the laws of thermodynamics only apply to isolated systems. Now, this is hogwash. Isolated systems do not exist. Let's take a look at our box in space. It doesn't matter how good our, ins our insulation is in the box. Some heat will get in or escape. It doesn't matter what you build the box out of, eventually it will fall apart in accordance with the second law, and thus even matter will be able to get in and out. Now to be technical, closed systems do not exist either, though we can get really close. Again, using your fridge as an example, there will be leaks of coolant from the system through the valves or microscopic leaks. Though these leaks will be basically negligible, usually for decades in the case of a fridge, it is material escaping the system. Now eventually the system will break down enough to where matter can freely enter and leave the system. Most anti-creationists simply recite Mark Isaac's page on the Talk Origins website. Isaac makes numerous fatal errors of fact and logic, which then gets repeated uncritically all the time. He tries to explain away the problems of evolution and thermodynamics by saying, the Earth is not a closed system. Sunlight with low entropy shines on it and heat with high entropy radiates off. Now, this is first of all false just by definition of a closed system. Closed systems exchange heat, energy, and work across the boundary. And as Professor Berger over at Bluffton University points out, the Earth is essentially a closed system. It obtains lots of energy from the sun, but the exchange of matter with the outside is almost zero. Now it is true we get meteors and asteroids hitting the Earth and thus adding a little matter to the Earth, but this amount is negligible. For example, if we were to scale up our fridge to the size of Earth, the leaks of refrigerant from our fridge would be equivalent in scale to the matter exchanged with Earth and the universe. Yet the refrigeration system on your fridge is considered a closed system. Secondly, Isaac is insinuating that the laws of thermodynamics do not apply to open systems which is again patently false. The laws of thermodynamics most certainly do apply to open systems. As Professor of Thermodynamics, Dr. Andrew McIntosh points out in detail in his paper here with the math, should you care to look. Thirdly, let's give Isaac what he wants. As I pointed out in Crevo Rant number 94, if we take our frog soup and put it out in the sun to make use of some of that incoming energy, it doesn't reverse or slow down the decay process, it accelerates it the exact opposite of what the anti-creationists are calling upon the sun's energy to do. 
Isaac also finishes off his page with the usual argument about snowflakes and crystals in rocks. You can see order come and go in nature in many different ways. A few examples are snowflakes and other frost crystals, cloud formations, dust devils, ripples in sand dunes, and eddies and whirlpools in streams. See how many other examples you can find. <laughs> Wait a minute. A second ago, he was claiming that you could work around the second law and gain order by adding energy from the sun. Then he gives snowflakes and crystals and is an example of alleged order arising out of these processes. You viewers are smart. I think most of you will clue into his error. His examples require the removal of heat, not adding heat from the sun. Furthermore, these systems only become so ordered and then proceed no further. Sand ripples do not turn into sand castles, for example. Lastly, this has absolutely nothing to do with the astonishingly complex organization of chemicals to make life. Here's why. Crystals, like a snowflake or geodes, do not form when matter is above the melting temperature. The molecules already want to stick together in a crystalline structure, but the heat keeps them bouncing off each other and in a liquid form. It's like magnets wanting to stick, to get, stick to each other in a certain way, but the energy keeps them apart. You remove the energy and they just stick together the way they want. But the building blocks of life are the exact opposite. Think of it like trying to force magnets together in a way that the magnetic fields oppose. It requires energy to assemble them and keep them that way. Unlike crystals, biopolymers want to break apart, not self-assemble. Biopolymers are like Lego. Having all the separate parts and just adding sunlight doesn't do you a lick of good. You need directed energy to assemble them. And in particular, you need a machine to direct the energy in a usable form. We're gonna take a break. You got 30 seconds to get another coffee and then we'll be right back. Funny, Fast and Furious. Ian's Crevo rants cover a multitude of topics in an easy to understand comical way. Complicated subjects that normally make your brain hurt, hurt a lot less when Ian explains them while wearing his anti-government mind reading equipment. Have questions about carbon-14 dating, natural selection, thermodynamics, or what on earth is he doing there? Three volumes of rants on DVD. Take your pick for $15 each plus shipping and handling or order all three as a package and save yourself 10 bucks. Order online today at Ian's Bookstore. first half of the show we were talking about how, contrary to the anti-creationist claims, you need more than just energy to make biopolymers in life. Let's now take a look at what else is needed. Now biopolymers have a lower entropy. They have less disorder and more order. Is that a reversal of thermodynamic laws? No, this is a local decrease. Watch how this works. Let's take a look again at your fridge to understand what's going on here. The inside of your fridge wants to balance out to room temperature. This second law is observable when your kids are standing there holding the fridge door open. But the refrigeration system reverses this process and pulls the heat out of the fridge, transferring the heat into the room. That's why the grill on the back of your fridge is hot. So the inside of your fridge is doing the opposite of the second law, but only locally. In other words, only inside the fridge. Well, the refrigeration system has losses. The compressor has a whole pile of friction, which slows it down and produces waste heat. A lot of the electricity is wasted as heat, etc. So there's a whole pile of energy that is used to reduce entropy in one area, and a whole pile of energy is wasted in the process as waste background heat. Notice a few things here. The entropy was reversed only in a local area, but the entropy in the entire universe actually increased with a bunch of wasted heat produced in the process. Secondly, to accomplish this feat, a machine was required. Machines require design, information, and intelligence. Machines do not just assemble themselves. Adenosine, adenosine triphosphate, called ATP, is the fuel for your muscles. 
Adenosine diphosphate has two phosphate molecules and is fused together with a third phosphate to make ATP. Now, there are countless numbers of machines in your body called ATP synthase that fuses the ATP molecules together. This machine uses the energy you provide from your food and oxygen. It is not 100% efficient, so some of the energy is wasted as waste background heat. The ATP has a lowered entropy, but the entropy in the universe has increased exactly in accord with the second law. Notice that a machine was required to do this. Not just energy like sunlight, but a machine. You can start to see why Dr. McIntosh wrote, as long as the laws of thermodynamics are operative, not even one biopolymer will form spontaneously without a pre-existing machine. What is a machine? Dr. McIntosh provided an excellent definition. A machine is a device for capturing energy from its surroundings such that it will be able to constrain such energy to do work. So talking about snowflakes and life in the same sentence, as if the processes had formed one had any resemblance to the formation of the other, is like comparing geodes in the space shuttle. There is no comparison. Why? Because it took machines controlled by information or intelligence, which directed energy to build the space shuttle. And thus, we see the connection between machines, information, thermodynamics, and the origins question. As Professor McIntosh points out, the building of molecular machinery only takes place when existing information is already inherent in the system. The information comes first before the machinery. In other words, you have to know how to build the machine before you can build the machine. Moreover, intelligence precedes both machines and information systems, and wherever information interacts with the physical world, there is a measurable thermodynamic effect. Intelligence is required to make a machine. As pointed out by Claude Shannon, after whom Shannon Information Theory was named, information very much follows laws similar to thermodynamics. Information only comes from information. Information only flows to an area lacking in information. In other words, you do not see stupid giving rise to intelligence. As Werner Gitt points out, there is a lot more to information than you think. In order to communicate information, you need a sender and a receiver. They both need to agree upon the language they will use, and they need to agree upon the method of communication, be it writing, telephone, email, whatever. Now, you can communicate information in a number of ways. You can use ink and paper. You can use dots and dashes via radio waves. You can use light over fiber optic cable, or you can use chemicals like DNA. Now, we represent the chemicals in DNA as letters, but having letters does not mean you have information. But you can use letters to convey information. What changed? The sequence of letters were the result of information. You'll notice that the information is neither matter nor energy. It is something outside of the matter or energy realm because you can use matter or energy to convey the information. In fact, the information controls the matter or energy. Just as the arrangement of letters in a book is not caused by the chemistry of ink and paper, there is no chemical reason that the letters in the DNA arranged themselves in the sequence they did. In fact, left to natural laws, the letters in DNA would not arrange themselves at all. The information in a book is not the result of the book. Rather, the book is the result of the information. In like fashion, the information contained in the DNA is not the result of DNA. The DNA is the result of information. Now, if you make random changes to a book, you will not get new information. You will be corrupting the information in the book. It's the exact same thing with DNA. By making unguided changes to the letters of the DNA, you are corrupting the information in the DNA, not producing new information. Now, if you were to add information to the book, that would be new information. But notice that adding information required intelligence and intelligent design. The molecular machines of life are built from the information carried by the DNA, including the machines that actually make the DNA and repair it. But yet, in all information systems, random changes to the information is noise. It doesn't produce new information, it destroys the information we already had. 
Evolution is supposed to operate by making changes to the DNA to produce new molecular machines. But this cannot work because new machines require a thermodynamic step uphill, assembling biopolymers which do not want to assemble. You need information to direct the energy in a specific way to make the new machine. But new information requires intelligent design. Now at this point, some people start jumping up and down and getting really excited, saying that I'm arguing from incredulity. In other words, I find it too incredible to believe that new information could arise out of noise, which has nothing to do with whether or not it is possible. I can't help but notice that you're arguing from incredible imagination and calling it science. I am arguing from observation. We do not design a washing machine on a computer only to have the file get corrupted and wind up with plans for the space shuttle. It is absolutely no different in the living world. What we observe throughout nature is noise destroying information. Not once, ever, ever, ever in the entire history of planet Earth have we seen information arise from nothing. Every example of alleged evolution that you will find represents a loss of information, not a gain. Why is this happening? Why are we losing information over time? Well, it's because of the second law of thermodynamics. The information in our universe has to be communicated on a substrate of some kind, but the substrate is subject to the laws of entropy. In other words, the books, CDs, hieroglyphs, etc., are all decaying. As a result, the information that is written on them is also decaying. It's exactly the same with the information in the DNA. And that was the whole point of Crevo rant number 78, the boat that don't float. So if your brain hasn't melted yet due to the heat of entropy, <laughs> let me summarize it all like this. To control thermodynamics, producing and maintaining life and diversity, you need intelligence. Intelligence that is outside of matter and energy. Intelligence that designed life and controlled matter and energy in order to produce life and all of its diversity. Now, could that designer be Zoltar the space alien? No, because Zoltar would be a physical entity who is not outside of matter and energy. And besides which, well, that brings up the question, where did Zoltar come from? No, whatever intelligence this was that created life, it was life outside of the laws of thermodynamics, who was able to control matter and energy in other words, a supernatural being, God. Now, which God? Well, there really is only one God it could be. Jesus Christ, who proved he was God with miracles too numerous to count. Miracles which directed matter and energy to reverse thermodynamics, showing he was king over all, even the laws of nature. Rising up from the dead to show you and I that he was in control of entropy and the way to eternal life. Now, he loves you dearly. But because of your sins, he cannot allow you into that new heaven and new earth and eternal life. In Romans, we read that the wages of sin is death and all have sinned. If you sinned, you are worthy of death. But then Jesus stepped in, lived a life in the form of a human, but never sinned once. He was the only human being ever to live who earned his way to heaven. He then died a sinner's death. It's like a court of law. You have been convicted and the judge has handed down your sentence. You are to be punished by death. A stranger in the room who has never done any wrong steps up and asks, asks the judge to give him your punishment and let you go free. But that man, Jesus, in exchange, wants you to live your life as if you were him. That means turning from your sins and accepting this unspeakable gift. Won't you do that today? All you have to do is pray and tell him you are turning from your sins and ask him to save you. And Jesus said, him that cometh to me, I will in no wise cast out. Woohoo! Mail for me? Hmm. Response to last week's show, Nitro Boy 756 wrote in on YouTube. Something I've never understood from the creationist perspective, which claims that all genomes are slowly degrading towards extinction. With their short generation times and relatively small genomes, why are bacteria and viruses even still around? 
thank you for this excellent question. I had a friend of mine who carries out bacterial genetics research send me in a response. It is because of their short generation times and relatively small genomes that bacteria can pay the cost of selection that higher organisms, such as mammals, cannot pay. The growth rate and population sizes of bacteria allow them to experience extremely high selection costs, 99.999% or higher, and still survive and quickly repopulate. Uh, in other words, kill off all but 1 in 10,000 bacteria and they could still survive to repopulate. Clearly, such type bottlenecks would often lead to extinction of many animals and even plants. Thus, bacterial populations can rid themselves of huge numbers of defective genomes and keep their overall chromosome fairly, fairly healthy. In fact, there is very good evidence that bacteria intentionally create mutations in their genome, and then what does not result in a beneficial phenotype is truncated out of the population. This is sort of what evolutionists want all organisms to be able to do, but clearly higher organisms cannot do. Also, the bacteria genome is far, far different from, for example, the human genome. The bacteria genome works more like the traditional way that we understand chromosomes to function a few years ago, probably because so much of what we knew about chromosome structure and function was based upon bacteria. The human genome, on the other hand, has many regulatory features, including lots of microRNA, poly-A sites, and ALU RNA. Bacteria possess some of this, but not nearly to the extent found in human chromosomes. The human population cannot begin to pay the very high selection cost it would take to reduce or remove the mutations accumulating in its chromosome. Hope it helps, Dr. K. I am so amazed at the amount of information out there that I know nothing about at this point. However, that will change eventually. In the meantime, Ian, I'm glad that there are guys such as yourself to unmuddy the waters or muddy the waters, depending on one's perspective. I'm glad that you're back to producing material and pray that you continue to do so. Thanks again, Ian, Thanks again, Ian your friend from Waco. Mr. Juby, I just wanted to let you know that I really appreciate all your shows and you continue to put out. I get so excited when I see another Wazulu video. Thank you so much for all your intelligent reasoning and hard work. Keep up the good work. Later. Thanks, Ian. We really are de-evolving. Studying the history of ancient man re reveals architecture which in many cases surpasses our own. Peru provides a nice comparison between modern buildings unable to withstand 50 years of earthquakes and Machu Picchu. Evolution wants to tell us that thick-browed, cave-dwelling, chest-beating ignoramuses magically appeared in Egypt, invented calculus, engineering, and then proceeded to build the pyramids. This is such an insult to reason. Well, we are way out of time. I'm your host, Ian Juby. Thanks for watching, and I hope you'll join us again next Genesis week. Remember the words of our Creator, the Lord Jesus Christ, who said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but through me. God bless. We need your support to help keep this program on the air. You can help by making a tax-deductible donation to Core Ottawa, Canada North Post Office Box 72075, Ottawa, Ontario, K2K2P4. You can also sign up for Ian's newsletter, detailing current research and news items at ianjuby.org. Thank <laughs> you.